Hi there on this Sunday, Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm Jim Bradley. I'm the author of a blog called Under the Castor Oil Tree. And I want to share some of my posts from this week. Uh, one of them is really long. I apologize, but it's something I wanted to share. And several of them are pretty, uh, shall we say, political. So I apologize for that. Uh, all the thoughts and opinions are mine and mine alone. So we'll start with something I wrote last Sunday, a week ago. It's called Halfway Between. I just realized today that my age is halfway between my mother's age when she died. She was 63 and never recovered from a stroke she had a week before. And my father's age when he died was 83. And two very different deaths. When I was in college, I noticed my mother taking tiny little pills. I checked the bottle and it was nitroglycerin. She had a heart problem for years and then called me. I visited her in the hospital the last few days. It was a five and a half hour drive from Morgantown, where I was in college, to Bluefield, where she was in the hospital. I wasn't sure I could do it, so I went to see the Episcopal chaplain. He put on a full Eucharistic vestments to give me communion and anoint me with holy oil. I made the drive fine. I fed her vanilla ice cream, but I wasn't sure she knew who I was. Lots of relatives around, but the day before she died, my Aunt Elsie Hours said to me, happy birthday. Only she remembered, and I hadn't even remembered myself. My father and I were with her when she died. The doctors had warned us that she might try to sit up even though she was unconscious before she died. She did and my father started shouting her name, but she laid back down and died. My father's death was different. He had gone senile over the years without me really recognizing it and called me in the middle of the night to tell me that my friends were going through his stuff. I flew out the next morning to Charleston and rented a car to make the 100 mile drive to Princeton across a snow closed West Virginia turnpike. Mine was the only car I saw on that long slick drive. I made arrangements for the next few days and he flew back to Hartford with me. He lived for us for five months or so until he started wandering away. I had to put him in a nursing home five miles away, and he kept trying to escape in his wheelchair. He wasn't sure who I was and often talked to me about me, thinking I was his cousin Ralph. The last talk I had with him was in St. Raphael's Hospital in New Haven, where he was being treated for a bowel blockage. He was as with it that day as he had been for two years. He knew who I was and asked about Vern and Josh and Mimi. It reminded me of talks before all this happened. I said, Dad, I'm going home at one point. And he replied, I'm going home too. If he had been a member of my parish, I would have sat down and stayed with him. But he was my father and I didn't. When I got home 10 minutes later, the hospital called. I just missed being with him when he died. I went back to the hospital and sat with him for an hour or so. The black nurse who had been shaving him in his last moments told me his last words. He sat up and said, I gotta get out of here. Not bad last words. He was a hard shell Baptist. Uh, though I never knew what that adjective was about, and a mild racist, and yet he died in a Catholic hospital 
being shaved by a black man. Irony is not there. I even let a Catholic priest bless his body. Uh, he might have scolded me for that, but surely he didn't care at that point. Vernon, the kids, and I flew to West Virginia on the same plane with his body so that he could be buried beside my mother, whose death he had been mourning for almost 20 years. When your parents die, being an only child aches as in no other moment. This next piece was from Monday, August 31st. It's called Bridget is Sick. Our dog Bridget is sick. She hadn't eaten much for two days and threw up outside and in the house several times and drank lots and lots of water, unlike her normally. We left her at the vet this morning and she did several tests and an x-ray and gave Bridget an anti-nausea and antibiotic shot. Plus sent her home with pills for both. She hasn't been much better, not eating and looking for water, but she hasn't thrown up and Vern gave her the pill for tonight with peanut butter. It's so hard to have a sick dog. Uh, you want to comfort and assure them, but, but how? Bridget's name was Annie when we got her. I know I've written about that before. But every time we said Annie, she would flinch. So we changed it. She knows her new name perfectly well now. We went to a rescue show and looked at several dogs. When we got in the car to leave, I said to Bird, we have to take Annie because no one else will. So we did. She was a rescue from Georgia. We're not sure how old she is, but she is the sweetest dog we've ever owned. She doesn't bark, loves affection. She's so dear. I just hope she gets better soon. I pray so. I'm not sure you're supposed to pray for dogs, but she deserves prayer. This is called um, Why I'm an Episcopalian. It was Tuesday, September 1st. It's a sermon I gave in 2003, a long time ago. And I thought I had posted it before, but I searched the blog and didn't find it. I preached the sermon before leaving to the clergy delegate to General Convention. And I still believe it. Why I'm an Episcopalian, July 27, 2003. I've got a little book here called 101 Reasons to Be an Episcopalian. Since much of what I want to say today is about the Episcopal Church, I'm go, going to read several of them to you as we go along. Number 87 by a woman priest from Florida. We don't have all the answers and we help welcome others who love the questions. 86 by a lay woman from Rochester. Catholic without the Pope, with women, Protestant without the gloom. Tomorrow at 9.55 a.m., God willing in the creek not rise, I'll be on an airplane heading to Minneapolis and the General Convention of the Episcopal Church was one of our Diocese for clergy deputies. I want you to know this. I am both proud and humbled to be one of the four priests representing the Diocese of Connecticut. Proud and humble, both at the same time, both together, just like this. Reason number 52, this is the only church that is lovingly loony as your family. That was my married license of the Diocese of Olympia. And a layman from Atlanta said, we don't quiz you on your beliefs before worshiping with you. What I want to tell you about the general convention of our church is this. It's a quote from St. Dame Julian of Norwich. All will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. 
That's not the message you will get when you hear the news media about the goings on at General Convention. What you will hear, unless you log into the St. John's website and get my reports from the convention, is this. The church is in a mess it can't get out of. Out of. Everything is falling apart. The Episcopal Church is about to split asunder and blow up like a cheap balloon. My advice is this, don't listen to that negative stuff. My mantra is this, all will be well. In today's gospel, Jesus walked on water. 20 years ago or more now, one of my favorite poets, the late Denise Levertov said this, the crisis of faith is the crisis of the imagination. If we cannot imagine walking on the waters, how will we meet, we meet Jesus there? Levertov said that at a conference of poets and theologians. For my money, you couldn't beat that combination, poets and theologians, people who anguish over language and people who fret about God. Poets and theologians, now you're talking. Let's cut to the chase. The real issue facing the General Convention is in one way or another, the issue of homosexuality. There is remarkable little amount of disagreement within the Episcopal Church about homosexuality. And that dis disagreement will come to the General Convention in several ways. It will come up over the confirmation of the election of Jane Robinson as the first gay bishop Bishop of New Hampshire. Robinson has been a priest for 30 years. He is currently the assistant to the Bishop of New Hampshire. Jamie Robinson is a good man. He heads committees for the National Church. He happens to be a gay man in a committed relationship with another man. Since there are 10 other elections of bishops that will come to the General Convention, not since 1870 has the larger church overruled the choice of a diocese for their bishop. And the other 10 bishops elected in the last three years will be proved by general convention without debate and unanimous, but not Gene Robinson. If I were a betting man, I'd say the odds of Gene Robinson being approved by general convention are about four to one in favor. And when that happens, you will read and hear how the Episcopal Church is about to fly apart and self-destruct. And I would urge you not to believe that. I would urge you to believe instead that all will be well. One thing the Episcopal Church is blessed with in abundance is imagination. We will walk on the water and all will be well. Number 22 reason for my little book by Elizabeth Gintz, a uh, canon to the Cathedral of the Diocese in New Jersey. The Episcopal Church taught me that Jesus came to challenge, not just comfort, to overturn, not maintain, to love, not judge, to include, not cast aside. Most likely the convention will also vote on whether or not to ask the Standing Liturgical Committee to prepare a ritual for the blessing of committed relationships outside of marriage. No matter what you hear in the media, General Convention is not voting to approve gay marriage. Marriage is a function of the state, not the church. So General Convention has no say in marriage law. Because of Connecticut state law, an Episcopal priest can legally sign a marriage license as an agent of the state. What I do as a priest in a marriage is ask God's blessing on the commitment and fidelity of the woman and man. What General Convention will most likely do is consider whether there should be a service to bless the monogamous, faithful, lifelong relationships of two people that is not marriage. The resolution in one way separates what the church does from what the state does. If that resolution passes, and I put the odds of two to one in favor, 
the church will develop over the next three years a ritual to bless gay relationships. If that resolution passes, you will hear that liberals and conservatives are about to tear our church apart. I'd urge you to spend to spend your judgment and remember this. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. Barbara Ross of the Diocese of Oregon said, at our best, Episcopalians can respectfully disagree about a great many things and still break bread together. Carter Haywood of Massachusetts, one of the first women to be ordained a priest before General Convention even approved women's ordination, she said that we believe that love without justice is sentimentality. There is a sense of deja vu about all this media hype about this year's General Convention. The Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion critics said, were about to implode and fragment a quarter of a century ago over the revision of the punk prayer book and the ordination of women. And it is true that a small number of Episcopalians chose to leave the church after those changes. But the great schism naysayers predicted did not happen. We had the patience and the imagination to walk on stormy waters. And if we in the Episcopal Church can find in the midst of great conflict and disagreement, if we can find our better selves, we will walk on waters again. The secret to our imagination as a church is that we Episcopalians deep down value each other more than we cling to our divisions. We are as a church dominated by a commitment to justice. One of the reasons, one of the one reasons was from Nancy Vogel of the Diocese of Vermont. Despite, or perhaps because of, our present disagreements in the Episcopal Church, I am reminded that God calls us all together because we aren't whole without each other. And reason number 68, a layperson from New York, I love our church because we don't think unity means uniformity. All will be well. We Episcopalians define our identity by our worship instead of dogma. When Queen Elizabeth I was asked centuries ago if members of her, cross should, of her church should cross themselves during the Eucharist, she said wise words. None must, all may, some should. I was elected nearly 15 years ago to be your rector. We elect our bishops. The presiding bishop of the church is elected by other bishops. The deputies to convention are elected to vote for their diocese by their diocesan conventions. And you elect the vestry members that make the decisions about St. John's. And vestry makes the decision of voting. The Episcopal Church is a uniquely American institution formed at the very time our nation by some of the same people. And the founders of our church understood the wisdom of the founders of our nation. The made way to make decision is by voting. Here in the United States and here in the Episcopal Church, we don't believe unity means uniformity. We vote on difficult issues and we move on unified, but not uniform. An inclusive democracy is what the Episcopal Church is. The loyal opposition is greatly valued by the majority. That was true of those who opposed women ordination in the 79 prayer book. It will be true two weeks from today for whoever happens at that general convention who are disappointed or broken and angry. They will be included with, they will be included. Without them, none of us is whole. All will be well. It will take a while and some few may choose to leave the church, if I'm correct about how the votes will go. But those who are happy about the votes won't want anyone who is unhappy to go. They will leave 
If they leave, it will be their choice and leaving will be more in the great way. And this church will go on. We will welcome all to taste and see how sweet the body of the Lord is. We will value everyone, no matter what they think or believe. We will never require uniformity to have unity. We will stand for love and justice, love and justice and the wonder of God. That will not change, not one iota. The next one is called um, Bridget is Getting Better and Other News. I am so messed up on what I've got here that I have to find the rest of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I can't. So we'll have to move on to the last post for today, Friday, September the 4th. Uh, tomorrow it is. On, on September 5th, 1970, Bernadine Pisano and I were married at the Catholic Church in Gary, West Virginia. An Episcopal, Episcopal priest was there, but it was short and sweet. Tamara is 50 years since that day. Oh my Lord, 50 years together. And she still surprises me from time to time. And I surprise her. On and on it goes, imagine that. We know each other so well, so deeply, so profoundly. And yet we still surprise each other from time to time. My love for her is beyond expression. We'll be with five or six best friends tomorrow. I'll take our wedding album for people to see us a half century ago. My heart is full of joy and wonder and thankfulness. Two children, four granddaughters, a life spent together. I'm amazed and so very, very thankful. I'm Jim Bradley. Uh, I wrote all those posts and the opinions in them are mine and mine alone. And I uh, hope you read them and enjoy them. And I hope to see you again soon on YouTube. Thank you.